sermon is brought to you by Pastor Robert Dahmer of St. Mark's Lutheran Church. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The text for this morning is taken from the book of the Revelation, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So far the text. My dear Christian friends, one of the most exciting congregations recorded in scripture is that little congregation at Smyrna. Their building wasn't much compared to the ornate cathedrals of the heathen or the Jewish synagogue, and their members were not made of the proud and the self-righteous and the rich, but of the poor and humble, ordinary people who were striving hard to make a living. And yet Jesus said to this little flock, he commended them because they held firm to the word of God, which would give them the strength to face persecutions with that were about to happen. In his opening letter to his first epistle, St. Peter described congregations just like this one. He said, I, Peter, an apostle of Christ, writing to the strangers scattered throughout Asia Minor. He called the members of this congregation scattered strangers. They were strangers because they didn't cling to the world. Some of them were strangers and had come all the way from Palestine, some hundred miles because of a very serious persecution in Jerusalem. And some of them were heathen, like the Greeks and the Romans, who had come to faith through the Apostle Paul. But no matter what their background, they were bound together by the Holy Spirit. Small groups of despised and struggling Christians scattered all over the land, strangers and pilgrims in a land that they refuse to yield to. When we hear about these congregations, we notice a similarity to congregations in our own age. Isn't our congregation a congregation of strangers? Actually, we come from very different backgrounds, and we live in different places. And yet we're held together by faith through the Holy Spirit. And we, like the members of Smyrna, are strangers in a land in which we live, forever striving against the immorality and decadence of the world about us, sometimes even despised and criticized for our faith. When St. Peter wrote these words 2,000 years ago, he was describing the church of every age, a church of chosen, scattered strangers. Ever since the fall into sin, mankind has had to struggle to retain their faith. Think, for example, of the godly children of Adam and Eve, Seth and Enoch, who lived in the wicked world of Cana Cain actually left the presence of God when it would have nothing to do with him. And the best his society could produce was the Tower of Babel. Or think of the few at the time of the Universal Flood. 
Noah was just one of eight chosen strangers to keep the word of God alive in the next world. Think of Abraham, whom the apostles call a stranger and pilgrim in this life, who didn't own enough land to bury his own wife, and eventually he bought a cave. Or think of Elijah, whom God sent just for the scattered few, and yet himself pursued and persecuted by wicked Queen Jezebel. Or think in the period of the kings, of that time when all of Israel was carried forth into heathen Babylonia, and yet the promise of a savior was kept alive by strangers like Daniel and the three men in the fiery furnace, people who refused to give in to the thinking of the world. Throughout the Old Testament, believers have always been a select few, so small that God does not reckon them as part of Israel, but rather as chosen sinners, chosen strangers in a wicked world. And you know the New Testament is no different. When Jesus came to home, he wasn't a popular radio preacher with hundreds of thousands, but he was a poor, lonely prophet with some very lowly disciples, most of them fishermen. And Jesus knew what they would have to face when they faced the world. And so the night before he died, he prayed to his heavenly father to take care of them. He said, Father, I have given them thy word, and the world hateth them, because they're not of the world. And then he added, just as I am not of the world. On the first Pentecost, when it looked like things were reversed and thousands of people came to faith on a given day, it didn't last long. For soon there was a desperate persecution with the Jews persecuting the Christians. So that Stephen finally gave up his life for the cause of the gospel. And the few that remained were scattered in foreign lands. From the time of our Savior promised in the Garden of Eden, true believers have always been just a handful in a wicked world, as the prophet Isaiah predicted. Quote, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived nor hath I seen, O oh God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that wait for him. We're strangers in this world, or at least we ought to be. We sing about it, don't we? We sing, I'm but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. Earth is a desert drear. Heaven is my home. Dangers and sorrows stand around me on every hand. Heaven is my fatherland. Heaven is my home. You know, it's not a shame to be called a stranger. For while we suffer pain and evil, we're really very rich. Listen to what Jesus said to that little congregation. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. What could be richer than to be chosen by God before the foundation of the world to be his children? with the inheritance of everlasting life. To be a chosen stranger carries with it the privilege of living like chosen strangers. When St. Peter wrote these words to the congregation, he didn't tell them how to live, but in a very kindly way, 
He spoke to them as people that he loved and wanted to encourage. Just listen to his words. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as pilgrims and strangers that ye abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And Jesus says the same thing to us when he tells us that we're in the world but not of the world because he's warning us not to be entangled with the things of this world. He urges us not to allow worldly pleasures, worldly lusts, or worldly thinking to divert us from the precious word of God. You heard that warning from the Old Testament prophets. You heard it from the evangelists. You heard it from the lips of the Savior, and you hear it from every faithful called servant of the word. Being a stranger is not easy. Because of our sinful flesh, we find it difficult not to conform to all that the world has to offer. In fact, the idea of a being a stranger just doesn't have any thinking in our world. People look down on a stranger somebody who stands for something that they don't like. And it was a cause at the one time for the persecutions. And today, our educators and sociologists kind of contradict themselves. First, they say to our young people, be what you want to be, do what you want to do. And then at the same time, with laptops and computers, they so shape the minds of people that they think exactly what they want them to think. To think like the world is always wrong. Listen to the words of Jesus. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Christian young people particularly are pressured by something called peer pressure. How often hasn't it happened that the example of a classmate or of a teammate has fled one of our youth into sin? One of the greatest temptations of the devil is that it has to be right because everyone else does it. And even us adults, we don't want to be rejected. The fear of unpopularity many times leads us to yield to the world instead of standing up for what we are, chosen strangers of the Lord. Christians may be strangers to the world, but they're never strangers to God. When the Lord spoke to the congregation at Corinth, he urged them to come out from false worship he said, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. And then he added that wonderful promise. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We may be strangers here, but we're sons and daughters of the Almighty Lord. From eternity, God has known your name. He wrote it in the book of life. He knows who you are and where you are. And as his sons and daughters, he promises you his care and protection. And finally, the wonderful fellowship that we enjoy in our congregation is not an accident. For God has sent faithful prophets to every age to gather the strangers together to worship him. As the psalmist David says, quote, God sets the solitary in families. Are we strangers? Well, we are, or at least we ought to be. Are we poor and unworthy sinners? Yes, we're that too. Are we alone? Never. Because we have been chosen by God and gathered together by the Holy Spirit 
so that we would encourage one another on our pilgrimage to our eternal home. Amen.